we're unfortunate that we have to move on with the program. So uh, I'll be back to you, Primrose. Um, Jamie Needham from uh, the Nationwide Children's Hospital Columbus. Uh, uh, I met Jamie in Cincinnati when he worked there. And uh, let me ask him to give his presentation about the surgical approaches to relating uh, incredibilities in children, past, present, and future. Thank you, Jamie. Great. Thank you very much, Andrea. Peter, thank you very much for the invitation to be close. Thank you for the invitation. And I, of course, congratulate you on everything that you and your team has achieved up till now and going forward in the future. So, so let me define the scope of the challenge. We know that pancreatic disorders in children are increasingly recognized. However, the literature on chronic pancreatitis in children remains very limited. Importantly, certainly in the United States, there is limited pancreas experience amongst pediatric surgeons. And equally importantly is that thus far, the surgical approach has been extrapolated from adult data. However, there are important differences in etiology and morphology disease. We always have to keep in mind that we want to offer the right operation to the right child at the right time. I hope to help uh, define that with this talk. So what we know from adult data is that uh, over 50% of chronic pancreatitis patients eventually require some type of operation. Classic indications are bile duct or duodenal obstruction, pseudocysts that can't be managed endoscopically, suspicion of malignancy. However, the most common indication is debilitating pain that fails to respond to medical and endoscopic treatment options. We have to understand morphology and anatomy of disease uh, because no single surgical procedure is recommended for all patients. So we know the classic large duct disease, large uh, main duct uh, uh, that's dilated uniformly. There's also the component of an inflammatory mass termed the pacemaker of disease in the head of the pancreas. The reality is, is that most children with debilitating pancreatitis actually do not have these particular uh, morphologies. So large duct disease, we all know that the modified pusto has classically been uh, offered. It's simple, low complication rate, preserves parenchyma, does achieve short-term uh, pain relief, but there is recurrent pain in over 50% of patients, likely due to incomplete duct uh, decompression or continued inflammation in the head of the pancreas. So now uh, this has evolved to uh, uh, being utilized in the context of uh, patients with uniform uh, main duct dilation of at least six or seven millimeters in size without an inflammatory head mass and perhaps an, uh, without genetic risk factors since those patients tend to fail uh, when they undergo PSO. The inflammatory head mass uh, classically been uh, offered a Whipple procedure. Obviously, uh, this is a substantial uh, undertaking uh, in a, a child in particular. It's obviously more commonly uh, utilized in the adult population. Low morbidity, uh, low mortality, but there is morbidity related to nastomotic leaks, late endocrine and exocrine insufficiency in the United States, not commonly utilized, but largely because of the lack of an inflammatory head mass. Now, duty and preserving pancreatic head resections uh, are now in vogue, the Vega, the Burn, and the Fry. Uh, and uh, the rationale here is that you preserve the uh, common bile duct anatomy, the duodenum. Uh, and in fact, those outcomes are quite favorable with respect to, with respect to pain relief. And in fact, the exocrine and endocrine dysfunction is less than. Uh, So, okay, there. So good pain relief, however, uh, and in fact, a lower experience <coughs> insufficiency compared to Whipple operation. So, so although conventional surgeries for chronic pancreatitis can achieve pain relief, pain does recur in uh, approximately 50% of patients over the long term. And in fact, the failure of a prior conventional operation is an indication to consider a total pancreatectomy with either auto transplantation. And in fact, again, debilitating chronic pancreatitis or debilitating acute recurrent pancreatitis without a conventional surgical option is an indication for TPIT. And that is shown uh, right here, uh, whereby, again, the majority of kids with debilitating pancreatitis actually have small duct disease and no inflammatory head mass. So the first TPIT in a child was performed in the uh, late 1980s in the University of Minnesota. The primary goal, of course, is to uh, relieve that incapacitating pain and impair quality of life. The goal of the islet autotransplant, of course, is to preserve insulin secreting capacity uh, to prevent or minimize postoperative diabetes. 
This uh, obviously, as with uh, any pancreatic operation, really requires a multidisciplinary team, GI, surgery, endocrine, uh, obviously pain physicians, pain psychologists, since these patients are chronically, uh, uh, have chronic pain and, and therefore have challenges with coping. Uh, and in fact, other services, hematology, infectious disease become important when we consider uh, proceeding with the TPIAT. What are the criteria that we consider? So objective diagnostic uh, findings of CP or ARP with pain and debilitation of at least six months, and that can be defined in a variety of circumstances. Certainly chronic opioid dependence, that's uh, an easy uh, um, criterion, or impaired quality of life, which may be either frequent hospitalizations or school absences. They have to have failed medical and endoscopic uh, interventions, absence of a reversible cause of pancreatitis, no physiologic or psychosocial contraindication, and they have to be willing to accept lifelong risk of uh, diabetes. And that's the reality. We're not at the point in 2022 of every patient uh, being weaned off of exogenous insulin after TPIT. Operation is performed uh, with, uh, uh, obviously, total pancreatectomy. Uh, I do preserve the uh, duodenum of the tooth, the pylorus, uh, so it's a partial duodenectomy, splenectomy for technical reasons, cholecystectomy, appendectomy, and a gastrojejunal feeding tube, since these patients universally have a delayed gastric emptying for a period of time after operation. The goal of the islet isolation is, of course, to digest the pancreas, disrupt the exocrine tissues, and release uh, relatively pure islets in as, as, in as small of a tissue volume as possible that can be safely infused into the pleural vein. This is a combination of mechanical digestion as well as enzymatic uh, digestion. It's termed a recording method. It takes about four to five hours. Uh, and that final pellet uh, is then resuspended uh, and assessed for count and viability. During that islet isolation, uh, we are reconstructing the alimentary tract and the uh, common bile duct or the hepatic duct, uh, as you can see here with two ruined wide limbs. And then that uh, islet uh, solution comes back to us and we access the splenic vein stump uh, and carefully and slowly uh, we infuse those islets uh, into, the, into the liver. Now it's important because to do it carefully and slowly because there is a risk of portal vein thrombosis uh, and therefore we heparinize, we measure portal pressures uh, we do have retrospective data that demonstrates that an uh, increase in uh, pressure of greater than 25 centimeters of water is associated with a tenfold increase in portal vein thrombosis. And so at times we have to pause the infusion, we'll wait for auto regulation to occur. Uh, and if that pressure remains elevated, we put the remaining islets uh, either into the perineal cavity or some other secondary site. Postoperative care is complex, obviously. These patients have two to three weeks of hospitalization. Uh, they're maintained on anticoagulation, and very critically important is the use of an insulin infusion with, uh, uh, that gets uh, converted then to an insulin uh, pump uh, after uh, leaving the ICU. And the importance of this is around managing hyperglycemia because hyperglycemia is toxic to those islets. Surgical complications, obviously it's a very uh, large uh, operation um, and it uh, entails a bleeding risk, oral vein thrombosis risk, wound infections are perhaps uh, a little bit more uh, common. Uh, enteric leaks and bile leaks are, are less common. All patients uh, do get a systemic inflammatory response. Uh, they all have delayed gastric emptying for uh, several weeks, so they are reliant on their distal feeds with their jejunal port with their TGA tube. And then longer term uh, issues are sometimes gastritis and an asthmatic ulcer, small bowel obstructions. Obviously, uh, pain management is individualized. Uh, it, in it includes a combination of our uh, chronic pain physicians as well as a pain psychologist so that we can introduce coping uh, uh, opportunities uh, and really um, utilize uh, any uh, or minimize any uh, impact from a functional and emotional perspective. As I mentioned, endocrine management is critically important. Uh, those islets uh, go through uh, uh, all sorts of uh, uh, significant uh, insults. So they don't have their vasculature. They have osmotic stresses, hypoxic stresses, and they of course don't resume full function immediately. And so they really have to rely on a nutrient and oxygen diffusion uh, to the core until neovascularization occurs, which takes weeks to months. And during this time, tight glucose control uh, to protect, protect them from hyperglycemia is critical. There are a multitude of studies that have uh, demonstrated that in various animal models that have demonstrated that hyperglycemia is in fact toxic uh, to uh, the engrafting islets. What about outcomes? So uh, this is uh, from the University of Minnesota group from 2014. As you can see on the left side, this is a reduction in opioid use. Uh, and on the right side, reduction in pancreatitis pain. And you can see this improvement occurs really within the first several months and those effects are sustained. Islet function glycemic control is shown here. On the left, you can see there is a difference between uh, younger children, five to 12, and uh, the older children, 
13 to 19, you can see that younger children are more likely to achieve uh, insulin independence. And in fact, insulin independence uh, uh, can be as long as actually has been reported over 20 to 25 years, uh, but certainly we don't have that data yet in, in the pediatric population. Insulin independence we know uh, is uh, really um, uh, dependent on the number of islets or really islet equivalents. So islet mass standardized to the size of a medium sized islet, 150 microns. And you can see here that as the islet uh, equivalents per kilogram body weight increases, you have a greater opportunity for coming off of exogenous insulin. This is, uh, these uh, benefits of TPIT have been uh, reported, of course, in the, young, the youngest uh, children, three to eight uh, years, of, uh, years old. Uh, and you can see here that uh, all children had pain relief uh, by uh, one year and were free of opioids by a median of about two months. And in fact, in the youngest children here, less than eight, over 80% achieved a period of insulin independence. Uh, and you can see at the most recent follow-up, 64% were insulin independent compared to only 40% in children, in children older than nine. But we, of course, need longer follow-up. Why do younger children do better? There are a number of theories. Uh, younger children perhaps uh, have a better metabolic milieu for engraftment because they have lower insulin demands. There's also some data that suggests that beta cells from young pancreases have uh, hot, a, a replicatory capacity. There's actually also data uh, that suggests that uh, there might be islet neogenesis uh, from structures of ductal origin that occurs in response to injury in uh, diseased pancreases. As I mentioned, insulin independence correlates uh, best with islet equivalents per kilogram body weight. We know from a number of retrospective studies that the worst uh, imaging findings from a perspective of atrophy, cal uh, calcification, ductal dilation, worse histopathology, and longer duration of symptoms actually correlate with lower islet yield. And so we really have to begin to think about how this plays into patient selection and timing of TPIT. And we of course also know that ductal drainage procedures, so Pusto or Fry procedure and resections uh, also reduce islet yield and therefore decrease the probability of uh, insulin independence. So we really have to be thoughtful uh, about what operations we're offering uh, to which patient. This is a data from, uh, this is a, an early study from when I was in Cincinnati, the first 20 uh, TPITs that we performed. And you can see a 90 day outcomes. So these are early outcomes. You can see on the uh, upper right of the slide right here, you can see that many of these patients have uh, difficulties with uh, nutrition. And so all of these patients are debilitated, not just from pain or poor quality of life, but they require uh, nutritional support. You can see even by 90 days uh, post-op, these patients are weaned off of TPN and only 30% are requiring uh, enteral supplementation. And you can see here quality of life, even at, by 90 days post-TPIT in the youngest and the older patients, physical health scores uh, improve even by 90 days after TPIT. What about long-term outcomes following TPIT? So how durable is it? Uh, so the only uh, long-term data we have now is a largely adult study, which is uh, shown here, 215 patients with greater than 10 years of follow-up. However, again, only 30 children out of the 215 patients. Uh, there's clearly durability uh, in pain outcomes uh, as shown in the study. Now, looking at glycemic outcomes, however, at 10 years, you can see that there is attrition. There's attrition in islet function. Uh, and that is the reality of what we face in 2022. This study did again demonstrate that greater than that islet equivalence per kilogram body weight was the strongest predictor of uh, islet graft function. And again, children had a higher likelihood of having uh, islet function than adults. So where are we going? So we need to, we need to uh, help to educate. We need to help to uh, discuss uh, opportunities for uh, making correct uh, or making the best uh, surgical decisions. Uh, this is a paper that uh, is coming out. It's now in press uh, from uh, our NASA and pancreas uh, committee. And you can see here defining the anatomy morphology disease, so small duct disease, or not having an adequately dilated duct uh, or uniformly dilated duct absence of inflammatory head mass, those patients really should go to TPIT. Now, patients that have a uniformly large dilated duct, then we might consider whether or not a genetic risk factor, a putative genetic risk factor, and not variants of unknown clinical significance, but whether they really should also be considered for TPIT as those patients actually are the ones that fail conventional uh, operations more readily. And then of course, how does the head of the pancreas and morphology uh, play into uh, decision-making? No inflammatory pancreatic head mass, FRI, which uh, in uh, many uh, experience centers is now preferred over modified Pusto. And then the inflammatory uh, mass present in the head of the pancreas, either Whipple or duty in preserving pancreatic head resection. Prospective observational study of a TPIT. So this is a, a 
a um, multi-institutional study in the United States, uh, 12 centers, uh, and we have uh, now enrolled uh, over 300 patients. The goal here is obviously to look at disease characteristics, patient characteristics that are associated with favorable pain and health-related quality of life outcomes, and with favorable glycemic outcomes. Also, we're trying to determine what is the optimal timing for TPIT from the perspective of pain resolution and insulin dependence, and is TPIT cost-effective? And then does central sensitization impact pain resolution? This is a, a one study that uh, um, uh, has now uh, come out of post, uh, circulating microRNAs in patients undergoing TPIT. And you can see there's a, 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 there are a number of uh, microRNAs uh, that we uh, can uh, utilize to, as potential biomarkers from the perspective of either isolation outcomes or patient disease characteristics. This is a paper on surgical approach and short-term outcomes coming out of post. And you can see here that the vast majority uh, that there was a higher percentage of um, genetic risk factors uh, in uh, pediatric patients versus adult patients, 83 versus 50. But of course, the caveat here is that about 30% of adults did not undergo genetic testing. And again, uh, the, uh, there's a, a higher percentage of adults that underwent a prior a procedure, Whipple, distal pancreatectomy, et cetera, prior to proceeding to TPIT. Islet isolation, of course, higher islet yield as we would anticipate. And from the perspective of outcomes within 30 days, longer uh, length of stay, 15 days uh, versus 11 for adults. Uh, however, a lower chance, a lower uh, likelihood of readmission within uh, 30 days. And in fact, portal vein thrombosis, interestingly, lower risk in children versus adults, 2% versus 10%. Uh, what about advances in islet isolation? Uh, this is uh, some work from uh, Bala uh, Pakalai, who uh, I was. Uh, very thankful to recruit to Nationwide Children's. He's an islet uh, guru, and he's done some of the uh, really uh, 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 landmark studies in determining how to better isolate islets, how to produce a better product so that we can achieve a greater chance of insulin independence. And in fact, he uh, was involved, of course, in improving islet uh, recovery from pancreases of children, which again are more highly, those islets are highly mantled, so they really require some nuanced techniques. And he's also working on improving islet engraftment. So he has isolated intrapancreatic microvascular fragments, which when uh, cold culture uh, with uh, human islets, you can see here by 14 days, there is an ingrowth uh, of uh, these microvascular fragments uh, into those islets. And you can see here in a uh, nude mouse model of uh, diabetes, you can see that patient that uh, mice that underwent islet uh, Auto transplant, or islet transplantation alone, these are human islets, versus those that had a co-transplantation with microvascular fragments. The latter, co-transplantation with microvascular fragments, had a quicker reversal of diabetes and a more sustained reversal of diabetes. What about predicting glycemic outcomes before we go ahead with TPIT? Patients come to us and they say, well, my ch child be off of insulin. Obviously, very, very difficult. Uh, and there are a number of uh, uh, studies that have attempted to uh, create models, uh, homeostatic model assessment of beta cell function to uh, assess whether preoperative fasting blood glucose levels, insulin levels may be uh, predictive of insulin independence uh, after TPIT. And then also around islet assessment. It's not just about the number of islets, but it's the quality of the islets. So how do we uh, assess uh, islet quality? So oxygen consumption rates may be measured. And again, other biomarkers, as I mentioned previously. And then what about non-hepatic implantation sites? Uh, and the challenge, of course, is the very substantial instant blood-mediated inflammatory response uh, when these islets are placed in the liver. So are there alternative sites that may play uh, an important role, such as an omental envelope, as in one of my patients? So just to finish up, uh, we do require, we do need clinical trials. Uh, this is uh, a list um, in a review uh, paper from uh, 2017. Uh, with a number of uh, trials that were ongoing, uh, some uh, completed, uh, nothing that has uh, really come to um, uh, uh, game time, so to speak. So ILA receptor inhibition uh, has not been shown uh, in the end uh, to improve uh, engraftment. So we really have to determine what are the next clinical trials so that we can uh, maximize glycemic outcomes. So to conclude, Comprehensive multidisciplinary team approach is critical to ensure optimal outcomes of pediatric pancreatitis that's debilitating. Patients obviously need an individualized uh, uh, approach to determination of operation based on disease and morphologic characteristics. 
in appropriately selected children, TPIT does achieve durable pain relief and improves quality of life with manageable glycemic control, but we need a, certainly a lot more research. Research in terms of uh, developing predictive models for failure of weaning and optimization of uh, island graphene and long-term function. So with that, I'd like to thank my current team as well as my uh, former and continued collaborating colleagues, uh, Dr. Maisenad Malhaja, and of course, all of my patients. Thanks very much. Any question? Oh, and, uh, okay, thank you. I have just a very quick question. Now we have a patient, then, uh, uh, and then I contacted with the Dutch, uh, the German, and all other European countries. It turned out that all of the techniques is available more than 30 years now. It's still, uh, it's still available only in the US generally. So, so what, what what is behind it? Because usually there is a no either surgical uh, way or or isolation way after thirty years. What do you think the bottleneck of spreading these techniques? So, uh, you know, certainly I think that um, a bottleneck is the combination of ex surgical experience as well as island isolation. I mean, you can't find that in places all over the United States. Uh, there's just really um, you know, limited number uh, of institutions that can provide all of that. Uh, you know, I think from the perspective of the islet isolation uh, approach, uh, or let's just say offering of islet order transplantation, um, philosophically, uh, you know, even in the United States, there are a number of centers that um, would uh, more readily say, uh, take out the pancreas and forget putting in the islets. This is the and that's exactly. And so the reality in my mind, certainly in children, right? Children have a long-term, uh, um, uh, you know, many decades to live, right? And if we can provide some semblance of glycemic control rather than truly developing brittle diabetes, which is more challenging to control in the sense of not putting in the islets, um, that must offer uh, sure. improvement to quality of life. David, very, very nice talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, two questions. Uh, one is, have you heard of the chemical PPIAT approach, which we developed in Pittsburgh? What do you think? Listen, uh, if there's something that um, can keep these patients from undergoing an operation uh, that is as drastic as this, and perhaps put me out of business, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think that we always have to be innovating. We always have to be innovating, right? Um, I, you know, I think that we're certainly a number of years uh, uh, off, uh, you know, prime time in that regard. Uh, the question is, is, you know, what are the long-term effects, right, of that chemical ablation? Uh, and, and I think we'll have to have some data to, to be able to recognize whether or not that is something to truly offer. Uh, can I ask a question? Can you hear me? Hi, so Hale. Uh, hi. Yeah, um, can you, can you, I think we close Can you wait just with. one sec, one sec. Oh, uh, so Miklos, sorry, go ahead. Let me, let me just finish and then it's your turn. Yeah. Okay. Second question, just speculation again. Is there, you think, in the future a way to pre-treat these patients for a limited time with some drug that stimulates islet regeneration and then do the surgery? I think what is going to be uh, more striking uh, and perhaps uh, more readily uh, in vogue is actually um, organo um, islet organoids, right? I mean, islet organoids and, you know, stem cells from that very patient. Once that patient has had attrition of their, their insulin secreting capacity, right? Can we auto transplant additional islets into that, back into that patient from their stem cells? I think that that'll be the way of the future. Thank you. So, uh, I'll go ahead. Yeah, please. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Jamie. Uh, great talk. Very interesting. Uh, there's such a great improvement in auto islet transplantation. I was wondering if you could comment on the status of allo and xeno transplantation um, in this situation. Well, I'll comment on it um, in any situation, uh, and that being type one diabetics, uh, et cetera. You know, the, 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 the challenge that we have, and albeit it's, it's uh, uh, an important consideration, is that allotransplantation is so much more heavily regulated 
uh, and the biological licensing that um, institutions need to have for developing aloe transplant uh, techniques uh, make it uh, uh, make it a difficult process. Uh, I think for patients that are undergoing a TPIT, uh, again, we're we're left with the point of you know what happens when those islets uh, uh, when there is enough attrition that those patients are back on insulin or on substantial amounts of insulin. Uh, and I think that at that point, we have to fall back to what are those, what are the indications for an allograft? Because again, we're introducing immunosuppression with an allograft, not, in, not with autotransplantation. And for children, certainly, the, the earlier in life that you have to introduce immunosuppression, uh, the greater the risks, right? And so whether it's uh, an aloe transplant um, for, of islets versus a whole organ pancreas transplant. You know, either way, those patients are then are, are facing uh, uh, the need for lifelong immunosuppression. So if we can put that off, uh, certainly that's probably in the best interest of the child. We have one last quick question. Yeah, maybe to comment uh, what you're saying with regard to the surgeons, I always have discussions with the Dutch surgeons because they are so preoccupied with pancreatic cancer that they forget that chronic pancreatitis is a disease where you can achieve much more gain in quality of life than in pancreatic cancer. To find a good chronic pancreatitis surgeon in the Netherlands is not easy, which I think is a shame. And the second question is with regards to the, um, you said, the opioid dependency in children, because that intrigues me, because we've learned in the adult population that if an adult is taking morphine for a longer period than three months already, the outcome of surgery will be worse in the end. Is that the same observation that happened to you? So um, we don't have that. So the question, the first question, um, which um, just lost the track for the first the question. Yeah, the preoccupation with yeah, the preoccupation. So there's more money. There's more money in pancreatic cancer research. Since I mean, I, I think that you know we have had. I mean, that's the bottom line. Did you actually say that? <laughs> uh, did I say chronic pancre pancreatic cancer? There's more money in chronic pancre in, uh, pancreatic cancer research. That's the reality, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and I mean, like, that's that's the reality. And so, who's going to want to go and you know spend money on chronic pancreatitis and how to develop better strategies mm -hmm. uh, um, for for care? Uh, the data uh, with regard to opioids uh, in children, uh, so we don't have that data uh, in children. I, I think many in this room, of course, uh, know the, uh, uh, the Dutch group, of course, that uh, has uh, looked at outcomes after surgical drainage procedures or resections for chronic pancreatitis, a couple hundred, 250 patients, uh, and certainly shorter duration of disease, less opioids, et cetera, correlated with ultimately better outcomes from a pain perspective. And so the question is, is how do we define when, when is the right time? Because the longer a patient is on opioids, those, some percentage of those, uh, some proportion of those patients are going to end up with central sensitization. And once you reach central sensitization, the horse is out of the proverbial barn. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Jamie. Um, 